Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kaya Carrington Russell, Australian award winning author of contemporary romance and kick butt heroines and dark fantasy worlds. And I have a very special guest for you today. We are talking reader award winning, order, Audi award winning, top 25 Amazon best selling author and USA Today, known for her powerful and impactful romance, known for books such as Before I Let You Go. We are talking to the one and only Kennedy Ryan. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. I am so pumped to have you on because you have been a staple in the author industry for a very, very long time. So it is so easy to admire you from afar. And I'm excited to delve in and hear how your career started in the first place and how you got to the point as to where you are today. So if you could take us back, that'd be amazing. Um, you know, my, I, my background is journalism, you know, and so I've been writing for a long time. I started, I always, I feel like I tell, I say this in every interview. So if anyone's ever heard it, they're probably sick of it. But, um, I started writing for like our city newspaper when I was 17 and like my senior year in high school. And so I always say, I always brag that I've been writing professionally, you know, <laughs> since I was 17. Um, so writing has really always been a part of my life. Like writing is a career has always been, you know, part of my life. I went on to journalism school and I never really thought much about writing fiction. I thought that I, when I went to journalism school, I thought that I was going to be like covering wars and, you know, reporting from war-torn countries, you know, and I'm writing romance. <laughs> so not a far stretch, <laughs> but uh, I, I had thought that I would write, you know, nonfiction, memoir, you know, I always thought I would write, but I didn't think it would be fiction. And, um, you know, when you go to college, a lot of times you start reading the serious books. And I stopped reading romance for a really long time. And then um, I kind of hit just a, a dark kind of rough time in my personal life. And I really needed some escape, you know, something that was just for myself. And I started reading romance again in my 30s and early 30s. And um, I just, I fell in love with romance all over again. I, I was an obsessive like voracious romance reader from the eighth grade all through high school. So I, I knew I loved romance, but there was so much that was fresh and new about it when I returned to it. And um, at some point I started thinking, well, I am a writer, like I do this for a living and um, just started really entertaining the thought of writing uh, for a living. And I wrote a novel and I, um, one of the best things that I had that I did was I joined um, a local writers group. And that was amazing for me because I knew nothing. You know, I, obviously I had a journalism degree. I've been writing professionally, but writing commercial fiction is very different than like writing for a newspaper or freelancing for magazines or writing for nonprofits, which is what I've been doing. And I kind of started at ground zero and assumed I knew nothing. And um, one of the best things about joining that writers group, um, it was actually the Georgia chapter of the RWA. It was in Atlanta. And there was so, it was just this huge group of women who were like-minded. We shared the same goals. They were so generous with their knowledge. And they really just helped me as somebody who was completely green in the industry, figure a lot of things out. And that's also where I first encountered authors who were self-publishing. Um, indie publishing was just getting off the ground then. And even though my first titles were traditionally published, that was my first exposure, like close up to indie publishing. Um, and really that's where I built my career, like over the last eight to nine years is through indie publishing. And then of course I returned to traditional with Before I Let Go. How did you go with that conversion? Obviously, journalism and that style of writing is very different with the creative writing. So do you think you were surprised a little as to how much you could bring over that or how little, like how much you had to learn and adapt in a completely different field? Right. I think that journalism, the legacy of it is definitely still in my writing. Um, it permeates my creative process completely. Um, uh, I'm good friends with Talia Hibbert. And I, this is like one of my favorite stories to tell, which is one day she and I were talking about, you know, are you a pantser? Are you a plotter? And I started outlining my process for her, which is basically I approach every story. I approach every book as if I'm writing a story, you know, so I put together my 
interview list. I'm usually interviewing 10 to 15 people for every book. Um, I lay, I have lots of supplemental reading. Like there's usually a stack of books that I'm reading for every story. The books that I'm reading tend to, they require, the books that I'm writing tend to require that. Like it's not a book that you can just usually sit down and just like bang out off the top of your head. They're usually grounded in a lot of information and lived experiences that I may not be familiar with. And so immersing myself in kind of these buckets of research is such a huge part of how I write the book. Um, and that's definitely a legacy of journalism. And then I think the other part is poetry. You know, I started out writing poetry and I, I know that there's kind of like this lyricism, this, sometimes I even find myself like rhyming, you know, inside of, of sentences. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that actually rhymes. I hope no one notices that, you know? So I think those two things, like the how I used to write a lot of poetry and that kind of shaped my voice. And then like this real curiosity I have about all these different topics that really drives me to research that kind of all crossed in, but craft, like the craft of writing um, as far as fiction, that was something that I didn't take for granted. Like I took craft courses, I went to seminars, I, you know, read books, you know, I just, I didn't assume that because I'd been writing all my life that I knew how to write romance, you know, like the beats and all of the, the all of the things that we learn that really make up a good romance. That is just because you can write a great article doesn't mean that you can create sexual tension. You know, it doesn't mean that you, you know, really, you know, know, have, know those beats to get you to a happily ever after. It's its own thing. And um, I didn't take that process for granted. Yeah. How do you go when you're researching? And I love that too, because with journalism, it is that innate curiosity about things. Mm -hmm. But also when you're writing particular topics as well, it can be very mentally and emotionally taxing sometimes too, because yeah. some of them are quite heavy. So how do you find balance with that? Do you take particular breaks between books or what is it some process that you put in the meantime just to give yourself some space and some generosity in the information that you're learning as well? Yeah, I, t I know like reader, most writers are like you write every day. Um, and I, I don't write every day. You know, I even when I'm like writing a book, um, like a lot of my friends will be like sprinting, you know, and they're like, I got 2000 words today. My word count today was 5,000 words, my word count. And like, what's your word count? I'm like zero, you know, because the first part of my process is so research heavy. I'm not thinking about getting words on the page because if I were to try to sit down and just say, okay, I'm going to write 2000 words a day, I don't have anything to say yet, you know? So that first part is just learning things so that it shapes what I'm saying. Um, and a lot of my books are emotionally wrenching, you know, uh, you mentioned the Rita award, the book that won the Rita is long shot and it deals in a really graphic. It's actually, it's coming, it's coming out very soon, August 8th. Um, the, the new, the reprint of it bloom is doing, which I'm really excited about because it'll get it in a lot of new hands with like new covers and, you know, mass distribution. So I'm excited about that, but it's a very heavy story that deals graphically with, um, intimate partner violence. And, um, I tell, I always tell the story about how, when I finished that book, I literally had a bald spot, like from, how harrowing that process was. Um, so many conversations with survivors, conversations with um, shelter staff, social workers, you know, it was, um, and you don't just like have these really difficult conversations where people are sharing like real life experiences that are that harrowing and difficult and terrifying and just kind of set it aside. You know, I would in these conversations and just like sob. And my husband would be like, oh, you know, did you have another interview? And I'd be like, yes, you know? And so I think about a book like Long Shot, which I wrote over the course of like two years when I was done just being completely drained. Um, and in a lot of ways, walking through that trauma was a little bit traumatizing for me. And I didn't write for a long time, like book two in that series. I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't even pick up, you know, my laptop for a while. And I've learned that a lot of my books require so much from me that I give myself that, you know, I don't try to go immediately into the next thing. I give myself space to reload, to refresh, 
I tend to kind of lose myself in the story. And so my family gets a little neglected, um, you know, spending time with my family. Uh, those are, you know, those are kind of things that I build back in so that I'm when it's time for me to write the next book, I'm kind of a clean slate. Um, so, you know, that's some of the some of the things that I do. I don't pressure myself to start the next book. It's also why I usually only write a book a year. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm pretty slow. <laughs> but uh but at your own pace as well. So that's not slow as well. And especially as you said, that emotion that you're taking on as well and discovering yeah. those things that are very traumatizing. That's very heavy, which is why I was very curious. Where, where does your inspiration come from? Like when you decide you're going to write a particular book, do you think I want to cover a particular theme here? Or does do you get a spark for something and think, okay, now I'm going to go down the rabbit hole for this. This is what's going to happen. Yeah, it's definitely, I'm not one of these writers who has like a dozen stories in my head at any given time. You know, how people are like, oh my gosh, I have so many books in my head. I just don't know where to start. That is never me. <laughs> you know, I'm the kind of person who is watching something on television or sees something in the newspaper or, you know, online and it sparks something in me. It's usually indignation or rage. <laughs> you know, you know, there's usually some really strong emotion. And I'm like, ah, somebody should be talking about this or, Ooh, I just, I want to explore this. I want some light to be shown on this. And for me, that's just who I am. I'm one of those people who's like a crusader a little bit where I'm constantly looking for ways to like fix the world. Um, and that makes its way into my books. You know, I see romance as a really safe landscape to explore difficult things because we are the only genre that guarantees a happily ever after. You know, you can explore these difficult things with the assurance, with the safety that it's all going to be OK. And so um, for me, like, for example, with the Kingmaker uh, and the Rebel King that just came out, um, that just re-released through Bloom, I was watching here in America, the Dakota Pipeline. There were this is a few years ago protest with indigenous people who were trying to protect their land. And, you know, there was a company that was trying to lay a pipeline, an oil pipeline across land that was supposed to be protected. And that just, it, it infuriated me, you know, and I just started thinking about the bad history, the problematic history that this country and so many other places have with indigenous people. Um, and as a black woman, just thinking about our history, you know, in this country. And this idea came to me of two best friends, one indigenous, one black, uh, Lennox Moon Hunter and Kimba. And what if they started this political consulting firm, you know, that is all about electing officials who are going to like champion their causes and advance their communities. You know, it's like, I'm like, oh my God, this is exciting. Um, and so Lennox's story actually came to me first. And that really, I had to interrogate if I could tell that story well, because I'm not indigenous. Um, there's a lot of, I think, a lot of intersection between, in this country, the experiences that Black women and, and indigenous women have. There's a lot of intersection, a lot of shared um, difficulty, uh, but um, but I would that doesn't make me presume that I could tell that story and know that story well. So that book, these two books, required so much research, um, and it was it was exciting for me all these things to learn. And then I wrote Kimba's story, um, which is Queen Move, the third book in the series. So, but it's usually something that I see in the world, and I am not someone who usually like builds my characters first. I'm usually doing the research. And as the story comes to me, I start thinking, what kind of person is going to be most compelling in this situation? It really, and you know, and then I, it's usually the woman I'm building first. And then I'm thinking, who's the best partner for her? Like, who is the best, who is going to love her the way she needs to be loved? The way this particular woman has kind of like risen in this story, how she shaped. Who is the the partner who's going to be best suited to what to what she needs? Yeah. Um, so it starts with the intentions. You know, what is it that I want to talk about? And then the character grows from there. I love that. I honestly like I feel so inspired just listening to you because you can your passion just absolutely glows. But also I love that you give a voice to something that you feel like really is not being addressed at that time in the way that you were impacted. And I I really I live for that. I'm so curious as well with your process, 
you know, obviously a lot of research is going into this. What do you do then after you've written the book? Are we um, applying sensory readers? Are we having a secondary type of process afterwards? Because I imagine someone such as yourself is very, very thorough. So I'm just curious as to what your your continuation on that is. Yeah, I mean, I think the first, you have, a, I definitely have sensitivity readers. The book that I just finished, I had 12 sensitivity readers for. <laughs> so there's usually like a small army of sensitivity sensitivity readers, um, depending like there is, um, uh, when I did Before I Let Go, which was the first book in the Skyland series, um, you know, it was dealing with uh, late term child loss, late term miscarriage. It was dealing with depression and other mental health issues. It was dealing with um, uh, just all these different things. It has these three buckets and I had sensitivity, sensitivity readers for each bucket of, of research. So what really helps is the interviews on the front end, because I'm not, I'm writing the story after I have a grasp of what those lived experiences are, not just intellectually, but with, for me, um, this is what I do when I interview, I get on Zooms and I record our interviews. And then once I'm done, you know, recording the interview, I start taking notes and I start figuring out how those elements make it make their way into the book. So from the beginning, it's being shaped by lived experience and, and by fact and by something that's authentic. And so then when it get when I'm done with that first draft, it goes to beta readers, which is different than sensitivity readers. I have like alpha and beta readers who are really reading for like character development and making sure that, you know, there aren't plot holes and that it's emotionally evocative. So I have beta readers. Sensitivity readers are really reading around around specific areas to ensure that I'm not doing harm. You know what I mean? Like, um, especially if I'm like, when I was writing the indigenous heroine in the Kingmaker, I had several indigenous women who were sensitivity readers. Um, and like I said, with, before I let go, there's child loss. I had several mom, you know, lost moms, moms who had lost children late in their pregnancy. I had several women who ha were negotiating depression. I had, you know, grief counselors. I had a psychiatrist reading because there are therapy sessions in the book. So it's kind of like you're sandwiching that creative process with, with authentic lived experience on the front end with the interviews and then on the back end with people making sure that you got it right. And I always joke that for me, writing is first Hippocratic. And what I mean by that is, you know, the Hippocratic Oath is first do, no, you know, first do no harm. And that's really what the sensitivity reading is, is I, you can write this amazing book, but if it's harmful to a community, then it really, it discredits it. And so definitely sensitivity readers are that I, who I compensate. Um, that's a really big part. It's like my safety net, you know? And when you're writing difficult topics like this, you usually need that. You usually, you know, need that safety net. Well, I want to say there's no pressure. <laughs> like for every <laughs> book, there must be so much pressure. Like, And obviously this is what you love. This is what you're called to do. So it probably doesn't feel like a pressure for you. But to Oh, me no, it does. <laughs> it does. Every book feels like a lot of pressure. Um, I think, and we're in a space now where, um, and it's not that we're in a space of with social media where there's just this immediacy in this virality where a slip up, you know, can become just a bomb. You know, it can become something that something that used to be small, like within a day is like explosive. And it is pressure in the sense that you when you're negotiating difficult topics, when you're writing into sensitive areas, you feel like there could be all of these uh uh, bombs, <laughs> you know, like all of these landmines and you're kind of negotiating them. And um, I am always very cognizant, not just that I don't want to say or do something or write something that, you know, has this like blow up and could ruin the whole release, but also that I just don't want to do harm. I don't want to hurt people. You know, I've been on as a black woman, I've been on the receiving end of seeing something written that is really just like offensive and harmful and perpetuates things that that I, I don't want perpetuated about my community, often written by someone who doesn't know and so I know what that feels like and I I never want that and so um it is pressure you know I I feel a lot of pressure and the 
the bigger things get, the more pressure you feel. I mean, from my perspective, there may be some people out there who are not feeling pressure, uh, but I, I definitely do. And it's part of the reason why in between books, I just give myself space to like take a deep breath. It's a big responsibility as well when you are advocating and you're voicing and you know there's yeah. many opinions that are going to be there. It puts you in a really difficult, not difficult place to be, but it puts you on a particular platform as well and there is a heavy responsibility with that. I, I'm i kind of curious if you ever in your, from the start of your career, whether you ever doubted your process in any way, not in the sense of this, but comparison itis is a huge thing that we see often in here. So I'm wondering if, because your process, I want to say, is perhaps not, I'm not going to say the standard romance author, because there is no such thing, right. but you have a lot of research going into yours. So did you ever think, oh, maybe maybe that's not the normal, or maybe I should be doing it differently, maybe I should write right. a book a year? Did you ever have that? Yeah, oh, definitely. And I think my process has evolved. Like, when I first started writing this, I don't think this was my process. You know, I it has evolved now into what it is and it is like this elaborate matrix of a process <laughs> you know it's like there's so much that's to it um but and I don't think it was that way I think in the beginning I can remember I just wanted to write which was amazing I just wanted to write emotionally compelling stories and I really I loved that and at some point there was a shift right around um I wrote a series the grip series and right around the grip series you know how people talk about finding your voice I didn't really know what that meant. I was like, I'm just writing. And right around the grip series, I understood what that meant because finding your voice is not just like about how you write. Finding your voice is also about why you write, you know? And for me, finding your voice, I realized that creative conviction is the bedrock of every story I want to write. And it also, there is something that I feel like I'm supposed to be doing in the romance genre. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm here for this thing and that's what I want to do. I, several times in my career have looked to the left and to the right when you're talking about comparison. And so many of my friends are cranking out four and five books a year, you know, and I used to try to keep up. And then I realized these books, you can't write four of them a year. Like it is, it is, it's not possible for what you're doing. You're not going to write four books a year. Uh, they, they, you, they tend to make a lot more money. You know, it's like, if you're cranking books out and also, writing into trend, writing to market, which is brilliant. That's a brilliant strategy. I don't have it in me to do that. You know, that's not how I find story. That I, That is not a criticism about writing to trends or writing to market. I just don't do it. And it took me a while to kind of settle into myself and say, okay, you're not going to write four books a year. Your books are going to be dense. You know, I, you know, I, in a lot of ways, dense. Um, and you're going to reach story in a different way. It's fine. You know, it's fine. Readers can enjoy both. Um, and so, but now I really, I really don't compare myself to people that way. Um, I have a favorite quote from Ayanla Vizant, and she says that um, a lot of people say comparison is the thief of joy. That's like their favorite. Um, Ayanla says her quote is comparison is an act of violence against the self. And that's much more my speed, <laughs> you know, that's much more how I would talk about comparing myself to other people as it feels like an act of, of, you know, destruction, um, because nothing good comes out of it, you know? Absolutely love this because I love that we're also talking over, um, as you said, is it, when was your first book published officially? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, the first book that was published was When You Are Mine. And I think that was 2014. Okay, so we, I think we almost 2014. up to your 10 year anniversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it was 2014. I'm bad with dates. Uh, but When You Are Mine um, was the first book that was published. It wasn't the first book I wrote. Before I Let Go, which just came out last year, was the first book I ever wrote. And it was just published last year. Um, but the first book that I ever published is called When You Are Mine. And I think it was 2014. I love that. I find we actually published in the first year. I find that really interesting. So, okay, almost a decade in, which is incredible. Yeah. And love this advice that you're offering because this shows 
somebody who has now been writing for a long time and finding themselves. And then when you, for those who are watching, who have only been in it for a year, maybe two, maybe three, and they are still finding themselves, I feel like a lot of them gravitate and bounce between so many different things because there's so much noise that's happening. And I think it's really important to highlight when you said you need to find yourself and fall into yourself and bring in again as to the why you're writing because, and as you said, you can follow trends and, again, there's nothing wrong with yeah. it. You can find what works for you, but just mm-hmm. because something works for somebody else, it doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And that's okay as well. So I would I would wither and just from creatively, I would just wither up and die. (laughs) You know, like I, I don't have it in me. I've tried like, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh. Okay. So when stepbrothers were so hot, okay, I'm going to write a stepbrother romance. And I just, there was, it was like a big black void, you know? And part of that is because I have kind of nailed it down to, there are three things that need to be present when I write a book. Um, and I have it, I have it in my head now. It's taken me a while, but when I'm like struggling to write something, I realize one of those things is not present. The first is intellectual curiosity. You know, like I, I need to be curious for myself. I want to learn something and I want my readers as they're reading the book to learn something creative conviction. You know, I am one, I told you, I'm like a crusade kind of person. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing, we need to be talking about it. It needs a light. It needs, you know, representation, it needs whatever. And the other is artistic urgency. Um, One of my favorite quotes is um, from Nina Simone, who said that an artist's duty is to represent, is to reflect the times. So for me, like some kind, there's something urgent that I want to talk about. And I feel like we can have meaningful discourse around it in the context text of art you know so if those three things are not there I struggle you know and I'm like why can't I write this book oh okay this is missing or this is missing or this is missing and I just need to sit back and realize something will grab my attention but I can't do that you're so beautiful like just with, I'm like oh words I'm just like you're such a poet <laughs> oh my God. you knew you were a writer that's crazy <laughs> Talking about obviously reinventing ourselves and growing and developing in this career, I do want to go back to Longshot because obviously we are re-releasing that. So how does it feel re-releasing, reinventing, going back to a book that you've previously written and making it bigger and better? Yeah, I think I I have a very interesting relationship with Longshot because it was such a pivotal book in my career. Like it made history, you know, winning the Rita Award and it, it got brought a lot of attention to my career. People who had no idea who I was all of a sudden knew because no Black author had ever won that. And so it brought a lot of attention. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of like... Um, I don't know. I'm I'm I've been first in different things and I'm always very careful to say I'm not that special like I'm not a snowflake. It's usually the system that is broken and it's taken someone who looks like me that long to break through, but there are so many people who were deserving before I won. Um but for long shot, I I was I tried to be very careful to say that with long shot. Long shot is one of the most special books I've ever written like Aside from the award, you know, you you have different metrics for success. And for me, my biggest metric for success is impact. Um, and I find that's less of a moving um, goal, you know, than something like hitting a list or how many sales or like those things are amazing. But if I focus on how, what kind of impact is this book going to have? And then as I have conversations and discourse and DMs and emails from readers, I'm like this, this book is the intentions I deployed this book what I deployed this book to do, it's doing, you know, that's like the greatest reward for me. And there is no book, no book I've ever written that has had a bigger impact than Longshot. Because you're talking about getting messages from women who say, I read Longshot, I finally left my abusive relationship. I read Longshot. I'm now working in a a shelter. I read Longshot. I hadn't talked to my mom in a decade because I grew up in an abusive household and I called her, you know, like those are Those are big things. Those are big things. And when you write something that leads people to those places, it just has, it has a different, you feel a different responsibility. Um, But also Longshot is a very difficult book. And so I feel a responsibility that readers could, you know, walk into Target now and see this book with this pretty flower on it and think, oh, 
you know, oh, just pick that right up, you know, and think that it's going to be, you know, something that it's not. Um, and so we have content warnings like right in the front. Um, but I, it makes me nervous, you know, knowing that this story that is so special, but also so difficult in a lot of ways is now just like out running in Target and Barnes and Noble and, you know, airports and people are just going to pick it up. And um, I am, I'm excited for the hands that it it finds itself in, you know, because I know what this book is capable of. You know what I mean? I've seen what this book is capable of. And to think of it in a mass kind of distribution way, possibly finding people to help and to encourage, um, that is the, the most exciting. That's the most exciting thing. It must be in so many ways so rewarding when you receive those messages and realize yes. that something you weren't even sure how it was going to be received and spending all this time in it and just hoping that it met a couple of the right hands that needed it to now go out so big and know that you're going to receive more messages like that really change people's lives that's mm -hmm. really special it uh, it is and it i get emotional about it you know i i have like when i say almost every day i have messages about long shot long shot released four years ago. So for four years, you know, I've been getting these messages and I'm really excited to just think about it, finding people who really need the message of that book. But it's also like this swoony romance, you know, and not, not right away, you know, because it does follow her journey. And then there's a space of healing. And then there's the happily ever after and the joy, you know, but it's all there. Um, and I really wrote it so that women who have survived these like horrific things would know you deserve more than anyone. You deserve a happily ever after. You deserve to be loved wildly and unconditionally. Um, and so those are my favorite messages is when I get women when I get messages from survivors who say this reminded me of my life and it encourages me that I can have a happily ever after that I can find someone who loves me you know there's no greater reward really than that with the platform that you've created I'm gonna call it intense for the reason <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> very open to receiving this is this all of this so and I absolutely love it and you have from what outside perspective looks like great success because success is defined differently for everyone with the Reader Awards, the Audi, the USA Today, all of those incredible things. I'm curious as to what has been the most sentimental or meaningful moment for you in your career. It might have been long shot already or was there another moment? You know, I think I've, t I've talked a lot about long shot because it is so special. Um, I won the Audi Award for real which was um, self-published. Well, Longshot was self-published too. I think that's one thing that's really big for me is that the kind of, a lot of these big moments have been around things that I self-published, you know, and they've been in spaces where indie work is not often recognized. You know what I mean? And so um, when Real won the Audi, it was, again, the first time a Black author had ever won an Audi in the romance category, but it was also the first time Black narrators had ever won in the romance category in like the 25 or whatever year history of the Audis, which, you know, you're just like, are, really? Like, how is that possible? Like, how is that possible? Um, so what was really sentimental for me was, yes, it was great that that happened for me, but the narrators, um, just seeing them get that kind of recognition was amazing. And Real also ended up on like, um, a, a, you know, in Times Square, um, on a billboard in Times Square. And um, then Emily Henry shouted it out on Good Morning America. And I was just like, this little book, like this little indie book that I wrote that, you know, it's not even like that big of a book to me there were and and I wrote it as um it is a romance but it's also like an ode to black creatives whose stories were overlooked and whose accomplishments were undersung and whose you know achievements were often appropriated stolen you know so there's so much special about real to me um which is it's a story about a director who finds one of these like 
um, a, a black creator from the Harlem Renaissance era whose you know whole career was overlooked. And he kind of decides he's gonna make this biopic about her career. And I always compare it to when Halle Berry and I think the 90s um, kind of unearthed Dorothy Dandridge's life and she made a biopic about Dorothy Dandridge and all these people were like, who was Dorothy Dandridge? And she introduced her to this whole, to a new generation. And that's kind of what this director does. And it's really just like my ode to black creatives, you know, who have laid so much of a foundation for people like me. And so that's for me why Real is so sentimental and all the recognition, the critical kind of recognition that it received was very meaningful to me very very meaningful to me so um mm -hmm. I just realized you can tell I'm Aussie in the sense I'm like the Audi award and you're like Audi I'm like I'm so Australian Audi oh no 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 it, yeah Audi Audi yeah Audi award Audi. That's it. <laughs> yeah Audi oh, I'm just southern <laughs> he's coming okay. in and out We'll find a compromise somewhere. Right, People right. Probably come and be like, neither of you are correct. No, I'm kidding. Yes, yes. Well, it's the highest recognition in audio books. So I think it's the Audi. It's called the Audi. Yeah. It probably is. <laughs> okay, so we're going to tackle something that's a bit trickier because there are so there's so much noise around it. What advice would you have for marketing? Because it's a tricky one, especially for indie authors and public, traditionally published authors equally. So what's your advice? Yeah, I think that it is two different kind of animals, you know, like marketing when you're self-publishing and when you are traditionally publishing. For me, the thing I keep in mind is that whether I'm traditionally publishing or indie publishing, it's all my brand. You know, it's all my brand. It's all my story telling um, no matter what happens, my readers are not like, oh, well, this was an indie book. So, you know, I'll give her a pass or this was a trad book. So it's not supposed to be as, you know, whatever to them, it's just a Kennedy Ryan book. And so I approach my indie releases and my traditional releases kind of with the same focus, you know, and um, even though a lot of people think, oh, well, if you're working with a traditional publisher, they should do all the work. That's not the case at all, <laughs> you know? And just to really figure out how to fill in those gaps. Like I know what should happen, what I want to happen for a release, no matter what. And if those gaps are there, I can ask, you know, a traditional publisher to step in and fill them. Or if it's something that my team can do. And I usually have my own team. You know, I have my own publicist who travels with me from wherever. I have... Um, I have two traditional publishers and a small press, <laughs> you know, in addition to indie publishing. And part of that is because a part of my like business model is diversity of distribution. So I'll publish with a traditional publisher. I'll indie publish. I'll do a small press. I've done, you know, um, with Audible, I've done audio, audio only. I just want to get my story to as many people in as many different pockets of the um, of the marketplace as possible. Um, I think that um, knowing your audience is really big and really it changes a lot. I think we're in a space where marketing looks really different than it did even two years ago. You know, like I spend so much time on TikTok, <laughs> you know, it's like. I, a lot of the time, and a lot of my friends who used to put so much time into Facebook ads, I'm not, sh I'm not saying that they don't anymore, but people are like, I see a bigger return from being consistent on TikTok or something that's out of your control is other readers posting about your books on TikTok. You see bigger returns than if you're like running Facebook ads a lot of times. And a few years ago, Facebook ads was like the bread and butter of indie publishing. So I think the transferable thing, the transferable principle is recognizing what's working right now and always learning. I was resistant to TikTok for the longest time because I was like, oh my gosh, like not another platform, not realizing that it's more viral and a smarter algorithm than anything else we've ever experienced as far as social, as far as social platforms. Um, and so some of my friends were urging me early on, no, you need to get on TikTok. And I was just like, oh, I just learned Instagram. I'm so tired of Twitter. I, you know, and now I realize that for me, that's just a part of marketing. And I think the the thing to take away from that is not everybody get on TikTok, but it is to keep an eye on what's working. 
um, and to learn, lean into learning about what's working and how it can apply. And I think, especially when you're indie publishing, and I think when you're indie publishing too, making sure that you're putting the work in front of people on a consistent basis, because a lot of times we just kind of like, Oh, I'm just going to do a cover reveal. And I'm just going to kind of let them know every once in a while that something's coming, but really you, you have to really just keep that content in front of them, whether that is through, you know, um, uh, uh, publishing, you know, a publicity partner, which, I mean, I don't put a lot of money into that anymore. It used to be that you had to have like this, you know, publicity company. Um, I do have a publicity company I work with and they are amazing and do some very specific things. Um, but for me, a big, it, I think it really is going to depend too on who you are. Like for me, I am a big part of my brand. You know what I mean? Like I, I, you see my face when I'm on TikTok, you see my face on Instagram. I'm talking about my life. I'm talking about my books. I'm passionate about my books. Um, I want people to know where these books come from. So, and, and to take care, you know, sometimes when they're reading them. So I, a big part of my presence on social media is talking about the books um, and so that won't be the same for everybody. I think figuring out what works for you um, is a big part uh, because if it's, you don't want to do something that's draining you, you know, for me, it's not draining, but for somebody else, they might be like, oh my gosh, like, it's just, it's sucking the life out of me. And I know a lot of friends who are just not on social media at all. And they have social media managers who do everything and that's what works for them. So I think that's, what's transferable is figuring out what works for you, not just as a writer, but as a person, um, so that you're not completely drained. Um, and then the other thing, of course, looking at what's working in the market um, and uh, making sure that you're learning into that space. I want to know then, what is your advice when it comes to creating opportunities for yourself, putting yourself, as you said, multiple avenues, trying to open as many doors as possible and also deciding which ones don't work for you. But what are some of the things that you have found that have worked for you? to create that? Um, it's so funny because I was thinking about this and I, when I talk to like young writers who are just starting out, I am, I am really adamant about knowing your worth, you know, like knowing that when you have agents and when you have, you know, people who work with you, like I have a film agent, I have a TV agent, I have a literary agent, you know, I have all of these pieces of the puzzle, recognizing that your work makes all of it go, you know, like your content, your intellectual property is the most vital part of that equation and under and find and val you valuing that first. And if you're in situations where that's not being valued, find another place you know, find another place where you will be valued. And I've, I've been in situations where, um, like for me, uh, my book, Before I Let Go, I think this story kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. Um, my book, Before I Let Go, has been optioned for television and it's now in Del by Universal. It's now in development with Peacock, which is amazing. I remember being with, I've had several agents, so I'm not calling any specific names. I've been with several, so it could be a, a bunch of people. But I remember talking with them about really believing that my work should be on television. And that's a bold statement. You know, everybody, of course, everybody does. But just getting the kind of response like, well, it's hard. You know, and really there not being a lot of energy around seeing the worth of my content. For me, I, the biggest opportunities that have happened in my career, I made them for myself. And it was often being in a situation where I saw something as my trajectory and someone I was working with didn't and being bold enough to say, okay, if you're saying that you don't see this as my trajectory and I do, we have to part ways because I'm not going to align myself with someone who doesn't see me the way I do, who doesn't believe in me the way I do. And also no one's going to believe in you the way you believe in yourself. You, ha you have to, ha there has to be something inside of you that says, no, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. I can back it up. I have the talent. I have the grit. I have the hustle. I have the discipline to get myself there, but I'm not going to be carrying around like dead weight of people who don't believe that I should be there. And then once we get there, you're like all, you know, triumphant. 
So to really find partners, that's been so huge for me is finding the right partners. I, it made such a difference for me when I found the right film agent. It was, it was like something clicked. She had so much passion around my work and immediately was just like, I love this book. We're going to find the right placement for this. Like I'm putting it out to all the places in Hollywood and da, 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 da. It, and it was such a stark contrast to people I had been with before. So that's why I draw that, draw attention to that is because finding the right people for your team is such a huge part for me has been such a huge part of opportunity, recognizing my own worth, finding people who saw my trajectory the way I did, being bold enough to make those moves um, and you know, so I don't know if that's the right answer, but those are some of the things that have really worked for me. Um, I'm going to say this know. on behalf of everyone watching. I love you, Kennedy, Ryan. Because honestly, <laughs> it's just, I love how much you back yourself up. And I think it's something that we have to often have the conversation. You know, we often cheerlead at each other, but then when it comes to ourselves, we feel like we're lacking something or we couldn't possibly be so right. bold i put ourselves out for that. And so listening to you, listening right. to your passion and your assertiveness and knowing what you want and that you're worth it, I live for it. Like, I love it. Right. And it's so funny. I can't remember. I love quotes. I love, I listen to interviews with my favorite creators. I'm always listening to interviews with Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou and just different people who really inspire me. And I can't remember if it was Maya Angelou or Toni Morrison. It's running together. But one of them said, you know, they highlighted the difference between modesty and humility. And she's like, I, modesty, so many times modesty is just us, um, you know, projecting something to make people feel more comfortable with our, with who we are. You know, it's like, you're shining, you know, there's something about you that you're doing really well, that you're great. And you, you, you project this modesty for, um, for the sake of other people. Humility is recognizing, wow, there's something I'm really doing well. I'm really shining, but it's not the point, you know, it's not the whole point of me. It's not, you know, this thing that makes me so exceptional. Other people have it. Like there's a, a, a sane assessment of who you are and where your place in the world and what you're capable of doing and not letting that take over your whole psyche, your whole life, become your whole personality. Like for me, that's a part of humility. And I think that sometimes it's hard for people to interact with someone who is like, no, this is what I'm worth, you know, and I'm not going to be, there's a really fine line between like confidence and conceit. And I never want to, I never want to cross that, but especially as a black woman, navigating these spaces where I look around and I don't see myself very much and I am constantly hitting barriers, you have to carry a confidence inside of you that is unshakable, you know, and that no one can touch. You like, you seal it inside of yourself so no one else can touch it or shake it. And that's what I've had to do. And does it ever falter? Yes. You know, do I ever feel insecure? Yes. Um, but I I have goals that I know I won't accomplish if I depend completely on how someone else sees me or what they see for me, you know? Okay, we're going to go into rapid fire question. I could talk to you. Okay. <laughs> um, we're going to go into uh, speed dating with an author. So I, I lit a candle, mm -hmm. I create an ambience. But basically what it is, is five rapid questions. Are you ready? Okay, okay, okay. What's the clumsiest moment you've ever had? Um, in high school, um, there were several. I there's this huge, huge flight of stairs. Like envision this big stone steps that come down from a football field. Like huge, like just flo floors, like built into a hill. I fell from about the middle of that all the way to the bottom, and. And the sad thing is it wasn't the first time. <laughs> like I am just, I am very clumsy. My husband, I will, I will trip on sidewalks, you know, like the little cur I trip all the time. I almost fall all the time. I every time I'm dancing, I fall. You know, my it's now it's the point where my husband literally just has his phone ready to record when I fall so that we can look at it and laugh later. Like I'm that clumsy. <laughs> What are the three words that best describe you? Um, I would say absent-minded. <laughs> I think that goes with the clumsiness. Like I really am one of these people who I'm head in the clouds, especially when I'm writing a story. 
it consumes me. And I can, I would have, when I was taking my son to school and his school was like 10 minutes from our house, I would have to use our GPS to remind me to turn, to remind me to get off the interstate because I get so lost in my head. I just don't, you know, I don't even like, so I would say absent-minded is one. Honest. I think I'm really honest. Um, and I hope authentic, you know, because what you see is like, it's what you're going to get every time, no matter who you are, it's going to be pretty much the same, the same person. <laughs> who, and you can only choose one, who has been your favorite character to write and why? I know oh, that's, that's that you see, that's not fair. <laughs> um, I am going to say, gosh, there's a character, um, Maybe it's too hard. Um, I am going to use the caveat to say there are so many characters that could be in this space. Uh, but I would probably say maybe Lotus from Hookshot. You know, there's a book called Hookshot. Lotus is, uh, she comes from a long line of like voodoo priestesses and she's uh, born in um, the bayou, you know, in New Orleans. And at, the bayou also lived in New Orleans, in Louisiana. Um, she's a fashion designer. Uh, she's uh, kind of like mis this mystical, amazing woman. And um, she's a fighter, a survivor. She's just... She's one of my favorites and she's also one of readers' favorites. You know, there's just something about her. She has a certain spark and I, I loved writing her. I'm immediately one clicking that after this conversation. <laughs> what is the song that best describes you? Oh gosh. Um, I don't know, but I think it might be something by Beyonce because <laughs> she has all of these like anthems, you know, for like, you know, like formation, you know, and she has all of this, um, I'm a diva, you know, like all these like big women anthems. <laughs> I think it would probably be one of those. <laughs> what is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not a lot of people know about? I don't know. Um, I sing. You know, I think a lot of people do, but I don't think people would realize like that was something that I was seriously considering, you know, as like a possible career. Wow. Have you ever put like songs or anything into your books or? You be yeah, possible? I've written, especially in the Grip series, um, in the Grip series and in the Soul series, um, there's songs. Yeah, I've written whole songs in those books. Yeah. I have had so much fun. Tell us firstly, where do we find you and what's coming out? What do we need to be on the lookout for? Um, you can find me at KennedyRyanWrites.com. Um, if you follow me on, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on TikTok. And my, you know, you had the little link in all of those places, like my link tree. That's the best. You know, it gives you, it'll give you my website. It'll give you events. It'll give you everything that's going on with me. Um, I think uh, up next, before I let go, was just such a, a big book for me um, last year. Uh, the fault, which is in um, a series I call that's called the Skyland series. The next big thing that's up after these re-releases, um, like Long Shot is coming out August eighth. Um, Block Shot, which is book two in the Hoop series, will come out in September. And then Hook Shot, I was just talking about that book with Lotus, will re-release in October. And then my whole. <laughs> My entire like debut series, which is the Bennett series, you asked what was the first book I ever wrote. Those are all being re-released with new covers and the audiobooks were never done with audiobooks. Like those are all being re-released. So I have six books that are re-releasing before the end of the year, which is crazy town, you know, but they're all like indie books or books that had very small, like print on demand releases that are now getting mass distribution. So that's really exciting. Um, and then in March of 2024, that's when book two of the Skyland series, which is the follow-up to before I let go, um, will come. And so I'm, I'm really excited about that. You are busy. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> very. We thrive in it. I love this. I can't wait to see it all. Sometimes. <laughs> Maybe you get sleep at some point. Yes, yes, yes. I have had so much fun today. Honestly, this has been very inspiring. I feel like I'm going to 
walk out of this interview as a girl boss for the rest of the week. And I just want to say thank you for coming on and who knows, watch your space. We might get you on in the next year or so and see where you're at. We'd love that. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'll love you later. Bye, guys. Bye.